Thank you everyone for joining, joining us back for this session titled Leveraging Game Theory for Explainable AI. For this talk, we are pleased to have our next guest speaker, Shashank Shekhar, Head of Advanced Analytics at the, and Data Sciences at Subex. In the past, Shashank has worked at multiple large tech companies and has been involved in solving various complex business problems using machine learning and deep learning. Today, Shashank is going to discuss a game theory based technique for AI explainability. Welcome, Shashank, and thank you for taking the time to do this tech talk. And over to you, to you now for the session. Thanks much. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I know um, it's kind of post lunch session. So, uh, I'll try and make it a little interesting. Uh, as you heard, you know, my topic uh, is leveraging game theory for explainable AI. Now, you know, uh, there has been, um, you know, a lot of uh, talks already uh, in plugin around AI explainability. Um, and therefore, before I get into my talk, uh, let me start by sharing an interesting experience that I went through uh, when I had just started my stint at Subex. So one of our flagship product uh, at Subex is Rock FM, uh, which is one-stop solution to address all types of frauds um, across voice data and digital services of telcos, right? So Subex, Subex you know, traditionally has been uh, dealing with um, uh, telecom domain and you know the Rock FM product uh, basically uh, detects and combats fraud you know uh, in telco domain. So uh, Rock FM has suite of machine learning and deep learning models to detect and combat uh, different types of telco frauds, ranging from uh, you know uh, bypass fraud, which is also called a SIM box, to international revenue sharing fraud, um, uh, to scan detection, uh, to to handset fraud, you know um, um, you know subscription fraud, etc. Uh, now you know. Uh, um, uh, you know uh, now in many countries, as you would know, you know uh, that handset is given as part of long-term subscription, and the increasing value of uh, handheld devices has made them a prime target for fraudsters. Uh, hence, a lot of telcos uh, deploy uh, you know AIML-based um, handset fraud solution to detect fraud and block you know any potential um, you know handset. Uh, fraud activity. Uh, these models, uh, you know, have large auto ML components like uh, uh, auto feature selection, auto algorithm selection, um, you know, hyperparameter optimization, etc. Uh, and they're embedded within, uh, you know, and the models are, are tuned in such a fashion that, you know, we achieve sufficiently high accuracy and the false positives are minimal. Uh, now for each such deployment, we also have a robust set of uh, test control framework to test the model efficacy um, in real world, right? Um, and, and, and for one such test control run, you know, for, for a large, you know, sufficiently large telco enterprise, a question was raised by the analyst um, on the customer side, um, uh, you know, and his contention was that for expats of one particular nationality, the model always recommended no go. Uh, when we deep dived, we figured uh, that while the model performance was optimum, this was because of the behavior observed in the training data set. And these recommendations were an outcome of multiple features, you know, uh, and nationality was, you know, just one feature among them. Uh, so this was one major trigger for us to start building something around explainable AI, because we figured that these kind of questions might affect our customer trust. And we being pioneer uh, of digital trust, uh, you know, um, also need to explain the why behind our predictions. And, and there were, you know, um, our uh, journey uh, into explainable AI, uh, you know, started. Uh, can someone confirm if my slide transition is happening? Yes. Yeah, it is fine. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, what, what, is, what is explainable AI, right? Uh, so, you know, if, uh, you know, when humans make decision, right, uh, when, when, they, when they make a decision, you can ask them, you know, how they made it, right? Uh, but for most AI algorithms, you know, uh, and you know that most AI algorithms, especially the new ones, right, uh, deep learning algos and others are, are mostly black box. And uh, uh, more often than not, you know, uh, you cannot ask them how they came to a decision, right? Uh, the goal of explainable AI is to provide a verifiable explanation on how, how uh, you know, a, uh, an AI system, you know, uh, makes a, a particular decision, right? And it's, it also lets, you know, uh, the human be in loop, right? So, uh, uh, you know, explainability, uh, you can say, is the bridge between uh, augmented humans and autonomous AI systems. 
So for a fraud detection system, you know, uh, uh, you know, just for an example, right? For a fraud detection system, it can be set of features with their relative importance, you know, which have uh, led to a particular uh, transaction or set of transactions to be classified as fraud. Uh, uh, similarly, if you uh, talk about uh, deep learning or let's say an image classification model, it can be set of those pixels uh, with their importances, right? Uh, which help classify the images, right? Um, uh, for something around uh, opinion mining, right, or sentiment analysis, you know, uh, it can be those uh, set of words, right, or those set of, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, let's say, you know, those set of group of words, right, which help classify a particular tweet or a particular blog, you know, as positive or negative sentiment. So, you know, uh, uh, AI expandability is, you know, differs from, uh, you know, uh, uh, not from, uh, of course, from you know domain uh, one domain to other, uh, and when it comes to uh, AI expandability, you will find people who are staunch supporter of it, and you will also have uh, you know uh, a lot of folks who are strong opponents of you know XAI. Uh, there is one school of thought which advocates that you know there is no need of explaining AI system, you know, and 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 we should leverage artificial intelligence for the work it is supposed to do, right? And don't think beyond it, right? Uh, uh, there is also this theory, you know, popular theory of illusion of explanatory depth, uh, which basically points out to the scenario of over trusting the model uh, or an AI system, even when the explanations aren't adding up, right? They are not correct, but still, you know, you go ahead and trust it. And this is because, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, the people are, you know, believing the explanation a lot, lot, a lot, a lot more than required, right? Uh, uh, but all said and done, you know, uh, if you ask me, uh, you know, um, explainable AI is quite a discussed topic and, uh, and it's pretty evident from this conference itself, right? Wherein we had at least three talks on AI explainability, right? Uh, and of course there are compelling reasons for the need of explainable AI. Um, I already talked about digital trust and it goes without saying that an explanation to a black box model uh, uh, will strengthen trust um, and, and drive adoption, right? So. Um, a lot many times to, uh, uh, you know, to have uh, businesses uh, or folks who are not from ML background adopt these uh, AI system, it's important that we explain, you know, uh, it to them. Um, it's also ethical obligation on part of the ML practitioners to provide verifiable explanation to the outcomes of the model they have built. Uh, uh, in fact, in certain industries, right, uh, especially BFSI, uh, there are regulatory requirements to provide explanations. Um, um, you must be knowing, right? Most of you must be aware of the Equal Opportunity Act um, and, and the GDPR in European Union, right? Uh, they kind of mandate certain level of explanation. Um, uh, explainability, you know, um, also help reduce false positives, right? And select better features, um, you know? Uh, and if you select better features, if you do it iteratively, right? Uh, uh, your ML model will be more robust, right? So explain, explain, explanation does aid uh, uh, in model robustness, right? Uh, um, AI expandability uh, also help remove uh, biases, right? So they can reveal spurious association and flag uh, potential uh, uh, for model bias. Uh, you know, there are a lot of lot of examples of you know um, um, ML model being biased, and there have been a lot of backlashes also because of that. Uh, you know, uh, in the past. Um, now, you know, uh, uh, in some domains, right, especially in medicine and you know, uh, in science. Uh, explainability can point out to you know a, 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 a entirely new theory right altogether right and and you know you can just uh, take those theories to lab and then validate uh, you know uh, whether those theories hold true or not so that's another uh, uh, you know uh, advantage or I would say a need uh, for having uh, a good explainable uh, AI framework uh, now AI explainability means you know uh, different things uh, to different folks. And uh, it depends on who is asking uh, for an uh, explanation. Um, uh, for and I, I, I assume that most of you uh, must be a data scientist. Uh, I was talking to the host uh, before this uh, um, talk, and he was telling me most of uh, the folks who join these uh, sessions uh, are from data science background. So uh, for machine learning scientists, for data scientists, AI explainability, as I said earlier, will help improve the model, right? Uh, but the, for the consumer, the end consumer of the model. Uh, uh, let's say for a policy maker or for a regulator, explainable AI will uh, help you know uh, them understand the set of inputs which were used to arrive you know at a certain outcome. 
Um, now there is there is certain uh, you know uh, definite trade off between you know uh, interpretability and completeness. Uh, there is this preprint on RZIP by uh, you know uh, LH uh, Jilpin and others. I will just you know show it to this uh, you know uh, uh, you know and this 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 particular preprint this particular paper talks about uh, you know uh, 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 what they say basically is that most accurate explanations because they are quant heavy they are math heavy right are not easily interpretable uh, to people right and and conversely the most interpretable descriptions do not provide you know um, um, the needed predictive power so uh, uh, you know uh, they, you know uh, now you know when it comes to uh, explainability and when it comes to completeness right um, you know uh, it also means that for different stakeholders of explainable AI, right? there, there are quite a few stakeholders of explainable AI, right? The interpretability and completeness will differ, right? While an ML practitioner will need more complete explanation, the consumer of a model would need a more interpretable one, right? So uh, uh, for a data scientist, you know, uh, the completeness of explainability should be uh, uh, of much higher degree than for, uh, uh, let's say, a regulator or for the end consumer. Um, now, you know, one related thing uh, with explainability is that uh, it's easier to explain less complex models and as the complexity and thereby accuracy, you know, of a model uh, uh, increases, uh, you know, the explainability becomes tougher. So for a linear model like uh, OLS, uh, logistic regression, etc., right, uh, uh, you can uh, get good explainability very easily, right? Uh, uh, on the other hand, with more complex and accurate models like uh, XGBoost, you know, um, uh, uh, generative adversarial nets, you know, catch nets, you know, uh, explainability, you know, is, is tough, 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 right? It's, it becomes tougher. Um, um, however, you know, uh, uh, we have done a lot of research uh, in this domain. We have developed, uh, you know, uh, some framework for explainable AI. And with recent advancement in this field and most of the recent work, you know, this does not, you know, hold to you know, in entirety, right? So, uh, uh, you know, there are uh, now a lot of frameworks uh, which also explain a very complex model, you know, um, um, uh, you know, and make it very intuitive and interpretable. Uh, now, you know, when we talk about, and see, I'm using explainability and interpretability, you know, uh, um, um, uh, together. I mean, uh, and this is, and there are, there's a school of thought that interpretability is different from explainability, and I know that. But I'm using it interchangeably uh, because you know uh, uh, that's the way uh, uh, it's, it's, it's mostly used, right? So when it comes to uh, explainability as a concept, you know it can be applied at any point of a model development cycle. Uh, you know it can be applied before uh, uh, the model uh, is built, uh, and that's called as ad hoc explanation. Um, uh, it can be you know applied uh, while you are building the model. Uh, you know, and it's called as in modeling explainability, or oh, and, and uh, you know it can be uh, you know it can be applied even after building the model, which is the most uh, well researched and most talked about explainability, which is called as post modeling or post hoc explanation. Now there are various ways of doing uh, each of these. Uh, you know, uh, 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 for example, you know pre modeling explainability can be done through uh, exploratory data analysis or through data visualization. Uh, you know, um, or or you can do it through explainable feature engineering, right? Uh, uh, most of these pre-modeling explainability can be done uh, through one of the libraries that we have created and open sourced on Python. Uh, it's called like Explore Pi. Uh, it has been used by more than 25,000 users worldwide. Um, uh, please go and check it on PyPy. Uh, uh, in modeling, uh, you know, explainability or doing a modeling explainability can be achieved by choosing uh, a model which is inherently explainable, right? Uh, there are a lot of models which which uh, are explainable, but might not always you know uh, uh, be relevant for the use case that you're trying to solve. Um, uh, it can be also uh, done through different techniques like regularization or uh, you know through model architecture adjustments, etc. Now you know most research and most of the current development, as I said earlier, in the world of explainable AI is around post hoc explainability, right and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the methods that I am going to deep dive on today uh, on this talk are also on post modeling explainability, right? So uh, let's, let's talk about them.
Uh, so, you know, when we started uh, building framework for uh, XAI, uh, um, for our augmented analytics platform, one thing we realized um, um, is that while it is important to provide explanation, it is equally important to make that explanation intuitive enough, right? So, uh, you know, you cannot have a very complex uh, explanation uh, because the end consumers of those explanations, more often than not, are non-ML practitioners, right? Uh, they are people from business, they are people from strategy side of the spectrum, uh, uh, you know, um, and, and, and that pursuit, we developed a, a library, uh, uh, we call it Dominance Analysis, uh, and, you know, uh, um, and, and we also open sourced it on Python. So uh, this particular library is open sourced on Python. Uh, this, is, uh, this actually is based on a concept, you know, uh, provided or proposed by Ezen and Budescu and is a framework for accurate and intuitive derived importance of predictors. Uh, um, you know, for uh, for any models, you know. Uh, uh, now, the, the models which, you know, which either has continuous or categorical targets. So if you're building a predictive model and you have continuous or categorical target, you can use, uh, you know, dominance analysis to find the relative or, you know, uh, uh, relative importance of, of predictors or derived importance of the features. Now, the intent of creating this library was to offer an interpretable and intuitive explanation, as I said earlier, right? which also makes a lot of sense quantitatively, right? So, uh, uh, you know, you have feature importance, tree-based feature importance. If you run random forest, you will have importance. For light GBM, you will have, you know, a set of, uh, 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 so light GBM, you know, XGBoost also has, you know, uh, 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 the importance uh, which it gets, right? But, you know, they do not always provide, you know, uh, uh, you know quantitative, uh, you know, sense, right? So uh, that's what was important here. Now, there are more than 30,000 users of this library worldwide. And, uh, you know, most of these folks, right, are from non-data sciences background, right? So people from social science medicine background, medicine backgrounds, you know, marketing and other unrelated backgrounds. So it's, it's a very good tool for a citizen data scientist. However, a lot of data scientists also use it. A lot of uh, folks you will see have created, you know, uh, kernel and notebooks on, you know, Kaggle, right? And they've used uh, dominant sciences library for Kaggle competitions as well. So, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, we basically created this library and, uh, you know, uh, if you see what dominance analysis is all about, now we already had a couple of sessions, you know, in which the speakers talked about SHAP, right? The famous library SHAP, which is based on Shapley value and cooperative game theory, right? Uh, dominance analysis works on the same principle and the math also uh, is the same, right? Which we'll, which we'll see in a bit, which we'll review in a bit. Um, consider your machine learning model uh, to be a game and all the features to be players playing that game. Right now, each combinations right uh, 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 feature will be a possible correlation. So, for a model uh, with n features, right, we will have uh, uh, two to the power n combinations or correlations, right? And how how it is two to the power n? So, because we will have some of n c zero uh, when we are only choosing when we are not choosing any feature, right? N c one when we are choosing uh, one out of uh, those n features, n c two when we are choosing, so it's combinatrix, right? Uh, so sum of NC naught to NCN, and that is two to the power N, right? Uh, so in a three feature world, right? Uh, in a three feature world, uh, uh, you will have uh, eight possible combinations. Now what dominance analysis does is compute a feature's incremental contribution across all subset models, and hence accounts for feature individual effect as well as effects in presence of other features that we call interactional effect, right? Now let's take an example, you know, to understand it better, right? So let's take an example to understand the nuances of decision making, uh, you know, in real world. Um, um, uh, let's say you uh, go to a store and uh, you are trying to buy a shoes, a pair of shoes for yourself, right? Um, and the most important factor which impacts your decision making uh, is, let's say, price. So you are uh, price sensitive and uh, uh, price drives most of your decision, right? Um, 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 so when you go to the store, um, you, you basically uh, shortlist two shoes, or you basically see uh, two pair of shoes, um, um, and, and you know, uh, uh, let's say one of them is Nike, and it's priced at $10, uh, and the other one is from uh, a local brand, and it's priced at $9. Now, even though price is the most important factor for your decision making, uh, but in presence of brand, its importance will change, right? So uh, uh, even though price was your most important, you know, uh, decision uh, making criteria, you know, in this particular case, you might go ahead and buy the Nike shoe. 
similarly uh, in presence of let's say another uh, 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 you know variable or another uh, factor uh, let's say color you know the importance uh, can further change and i'm not talking about the direction of important but i'm also I, i'm i'm talking about the magnitude as well right so i'm talking about magnitude uh, the effect you know this particular effect is called as interaction effect you must be knowing you know it's a pretty uh, well discussed effect as such now price alone in this case had different magnitude of importance but in presence of brand the importance changed right uh, let's look at you know another uh, use case right uh, 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 you know uh, so let's consider a scenario um, of an e-commerce company where the data sciences team run a model and predict the satisfaction score for each customer based on various features so um, there can be features like uh, uh, you know uh, product uh, quality um, you know um, uh, price uh, delivery time uh, technical support quality um, um, you know and, and, and maybe warranty and other factors right so there can be several attributes you know which they basically uh, take to predict what will be the likely customer satisfaction score right based on their purchase history and um, other 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 um, uh, you know attributes now let's say the chief customer officer uh, you know of of the, of this company has a budget of uh, $100000 and she wants to allocate it across uh, uh, these attributes in order to maximize customer satisfaction so the goal for her is to maximize customer satisfaction now what a framework like dominance analysis will provide is the derived importance of each of the attributes uh, computed across all subset models so if price comes as 20% important the chief customer officer can can allocate 20% or in this case you know $20000 uh, to the over of the you know uh, to, to to pricing right uh, to improve pricing and hence improve customer satisfaction now this particular framework uh, you know is called as a marginal resource allocation model right when one can marginally allocate resources to maximize a particular outcome now most of the feature important that you get from tree based methods and other methods you know will not help you uh, do this right will not help you marginally allo allo allocate resources right uh, but in this case you can you know using dominance analysis you can marginally allocate your resources across different actionable you know uh, 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 you know attributes to maximize a certain outcome uh, you know uh, you know one other big and quite contentious problem right uh, uh, in the digital world uh, is that of multi channel or multi touch attribution um, uh, it is a problem when you have to allocate the revenue generated across various channels like uh, um, you know affiliate uh, you have seo scm and different other channels right social media channel direct channels right uh, so basically you know the revenue generators they are widgets right there tra there is traffic which are which gets generated through these channels and then uh, you know uh, some uh, revenue is generated right uh, uh, so the, the 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 issue here is how to effectively allocate right uh, or attribute uh, different purchases or revenue generating uh, you know uh, uh, actions to different channels right um, now you know this is very effectively solved by you know a framework like dominance analysis right and uh, each of the channels can be assumed as a player and then their contribution can be evaluated across all possible correlations right so because of the intuitive nature of uh, dominance analysis it can be applied across compendium of other use cases apart from of course its prime objective of explaining uh, ml models right uh, now you know uh, as i said earlier dominance analysis works on the principle of cooperative game theory it works on you know safely values uh, uh, you know uh, um, uh, let's try and understand the principle in detail right uh, let's take an example where three players are playing a game of poker right uh, 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 you know uh, now for three players there are in total uh, uh, 2 to the power 3 that is eight possible correlations the illustration on the right of the slide right uh, provides different payouts for each correlation so they are playing poker when none of the player will play there will be no payout of course right so it's zero dollar when uh, a alone uh, you know uh, plays you know the payout uh, is seven dollars or he he basically is able to get seven dollars when b alone plays the payoff is four dollars when c alone plays it's six dollar when a and b together form a correlation and play uh, the payout is seven dollars when A and C together play, you know, the payout is $15, whereas when B and C play, the payout is $9, right? Uh, however, when all the three players play, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, total payout is $19, right? Uh, now, you know, what we want to find is that when all the three form a correlation and play together, what 
you know, uh, what will be the share of A, B, and C respectively. Now, you know, uh, there will be, you know, if you see, you know, um, uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, there are three C2 possible coalitions. Uh, if out of three players, if you are finding uh, all the coalitions uh, which have uh, two players, you know, there will be three C2 such coalitions, right? So there are three such coalition, right? Uh, um, you know, uh, now let's let's look at it, right? How how we go about calculating it, right? Uh, so what we do is, you know, we basically, as, as we know, safely, you know, uh, uh, you know, works a cooperative game theory works on the principle of calculating the marginal contribution of each players across all possible combinations. And then we average them, right? So let's do it for A. Now when A plays alone, the payout is $7. And hence A's individual contribution is $7. Now let's look at correlation of two players where A is one player. And uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say you know, two players. So there are two such correlations when A is one player. So there's a correlation A, B and there's a correlation A, C. Let's evaluate A, B. So when B uh, you know, plays alone, the payoff is $4. Whereas in when A joins B, uh, you know, the payout becomes seven dollars. So the incremental contribution of A to this particular coalition, right, when A and B plays together is three dollars. Similarly, when C play, plays alone, um, the payoff is six dollars. Uh, but when A joins this coalition, you know, uh, A joins C, you know, the payoff for this coalition becomes fifteen dollars. So incremental, you know, uh, uh, um, payoff or incremental contribution of A to this particular coalition, coalition of A and C is 15 minus six, which is $9, right? Now what we do is we find average incremental, uh, you know, uh, contribution of A to all the coalitions of size two, right? So, uh, you know, uh, um, in this case, there are two such coalitions that we said, A and B and A and C. So uh, with A and B, the incremental contribution of A was uh, $3 and with A and C, the incremental contribution was $9. So A's contribution in group of two, you know, uh, becomes uh, a nine plus three, 12 divided by two, which is $6, right? Now let's uh, look at, you know, uh, A's contribution in group of three or, you know, the, the uh, grand coalition, right? So the grand coalition here is of A, B and C. When B and C, you know, play alone, you know, the payoff was $9, but when A joined them, the payoff became $19, which was $10 more than B and C playing together, right? So A's contribution to the grand coalition becomes $10. So if you see here, you know, A's individual contribution was $7, A's contribution to the group of two was, uh, uh, A's average contribution, should, you know, rather, to the group of two was, uh, uh, you know, $6, and A's contribution to the group of three was ten dollars right so a share in the payoff uh, you know um, will be the average of these three seven six and ten and that would be seven point six seven right uh, similarly you can calculate uh, you know the uh, you know uh, b share and c share right and these these values are called as safely values right and if you find the sum of a share b share and c share that will be the payout payoff to the you know uh, of the grand coalition which was nineteen dollars right so, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is what safely value is all about. Now, there are a few properties of safely values, right? So, uh, uh, you know, and these are unique properties. They are, uh, you know, you can call them axioms of safely values. Uh, they are efficiency, symmetry, uh, dummy, and additivity. Uh, efficiency means uh, the individual share of profit should add up to the total, as we saw in the case of the game of poker, right? That's what uh, efficiency means. Symmetry means, you know, uh, if two, uh, uh, you know, players contribute the same to each coalition, they should have equal share, right? So if there are two players uh, and they are contributing exactly same to each coalition they are part of, you know, they should have equal share in the end. Uh, dummy, you know, we saw dummy uh, in case of poker, right? Dummy implies that if a player contributes nothing to each coalition, he should receive nothing, right? So no contribution means he should receive nothing. So these, these axioms are also axioms of fairness, right? So safely value is a very fair, uh, uh, method as such. Additivity means, uh, you know, uh, that the reward uh, from playing two different games independently is same as playing one with added valuation, right? So rather than playing two rounds of, uh, 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 let's say, uh, American Roulette, right? Uh, you are in Las Vegas and you intend to play multiple rounds of, you know, uh, 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 American Roulette to increase your payouts, you know, uh, uh, and uh, you go to those uh, uh, you know casinos which had dollar five payout for each correct guess 
you know, you'd rather go and play one round um, or dollar 10 payout, right? So go to a casino, which gives you $10 payout. So that's, that's, that's what additivity is all about, right? Uh, it's pretty intuitive. The property axioms are pretty intuitive and very powerful also. Um, uh, this makes a free value um, a very powerful method altogether. Now, you know, I did talk about the math of safely value, but let's take another real world example uh, to understand the mass of safely values better, right? Uh, uh, so let's say there are three people, uh, A, B, and C. They work in the same um, um, office and stay in the same straight path, right? Uh, 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 you know, when A takes a meter taxi, right? Meter taxi um, uh, are not on the norm now. I mean, you will always have Search pricing and things like those, but let's say you know they are they are taking meter taxi, and uh, you know when A travels alone to his house, you know uh, the fare comes out to be six dollars. Uh, uh, when B uh, travels alone, uh, you know the fare comes out to be twelve dollars, and when C uh, travels alone, the fare comes out to be forty-two dollars. Right? As I said, you know A, B, and C, uh, you know assume they stay uh, you know on the same path. Right. So there is no diversion. There is no, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, there is no roundabout way of going to each other's house. It's, it's, they are all, uh, you know, staying uh, on the same straight path. Right. Uh, now, you know, uh, what now, now, you know, what happens is that A, A B and C, uh, they decide to do a, a taxi pooling. Right. Uh, and decided to split the overall cost among themselves. Now, you know, uh, we need to calculate. Right. Uh, what would be their share to the overall cost? Now, if you ask someone, right, if 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 we just say that you know, uh, let A pay the amount till the point uh, he gets off, and then B pays the differential, and then C pays the differential, then in that case, A, right, will not have any profit or any gain out of this coalition, right? So uh, A will not be able to derive any gain because his drop is first, and by that time, the meter will still show dollar six. So, you know, uh, um, now, you know, uh, let's, let's look at, uh, now, 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 since there are three people, right, let's take all the combinations of, uh, or let's say all permut rather permutations, right, of all the order in which A, B, C can make the payment to the driver, right, uh, uh, irrespective of the order in which they get down, right, so irrespective of the order in which they get down, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, let's, let's, let's consider all the permutations in which A, B, and C can make the payments, right. Uh, so, uh, since, you know, there are three, uh, 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 you know, uh, people, the total permutations will be three factorial, which is six. Now let's look at each of these, you know, permutations, right? So the first permutation is A, B, and C, um, uh, pretty straightforward one. So A makes the first, uh, A is the first one to make the payment, B is the second one, and C is the third one. Assume that they can make payment before, you know, they get off, right? So even, even, uh, you know, uh, before they get off, right? So. Uh, in case of A, B, and C, uh, A will pay six dollars because that's the fare uh, that comes till his point, right? Uh, B will, uh, uh, when B will reach his point, you know the meter will show twelve dollars, but he will only pay the differential because A has covered six dollars. He will only pay the additional six dollars, and C will pay the rest, which is thirty dollars, right? Uh, the next, you know, uh, uh, permutation can be A, C, D where A pays, uh, you know, uh, uh, $6, of course, right? Because he's the first one to get off and, uh, you know, the meter shows $6 till his place, uh, uh, you know, and then C is the one who has to make the payment. So C will pay, you know, uh, uh, total fare till his point, which is $42 minus what has already been paid, which is $6. So C will pay $36. And B will be the last one to pay, but he will not have to pay anything because A and C has covered the cost, right? Now, similarly, you know, there will be another uh, combination, which is BC, another permutation, which is BCA, where B makes the first payment and B will pay, uh, you know, since B is the first one to pay, he will have to pay $12, which is the fare till his point. Uh, um, and C pays the, you know, uh, uh, difference between total fare till his point minus what has already been paid, which is $30. And since B and C has taken care of, you know, uh, uh, the cost, you know, of the, of the travel, uh, you know, A, you know uh, A will not have to pay anything. Uh, in case of CAB, you know, uh, C will pay uh, the fare uh, first. So he will pay $42, you know, the total fare of the trip uh, because the, his is last drop. Uh, and in this case, C and A will not have to pay anything, right? Oh, sorry, A and B will not have to pay anything. Similarly, in case of CBA, C will pay the whole fare and A and B will not have to pay anything. Now, what we do is we find the average 
of each of these permutations, right? So we find the average cost for A, you know, finding average of each of these uh, permutations so that will come to $2, you know, uh, the cost uh, for B will come out to be $5 and the cost for C will come out to be uh, $35. So you see, they is still, uh, you know, sum up to $42, but in this case, you know, A is saving, you know, uh, 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 $4 um, on the overall expense and B is saving, you know, uh, you know, uh, $7 and C uh, as well as saving $7, right? So this coalition has helped them, you know, make some profit. Now, you know, I have talked about uh, uh, the maths uh, of safely value. It's also important to talk about math of dominance analysis, right? And, and it should be pretty quick because math of dominance analysis is pretty much derived from the math of the safely value, right? Uh, where the model can be considered as a game and each feature can be considered as an individual player. So if there are n features, you know, uh, you will have two to the power n uh, minus one model, right? So why minus one? Because we are, uh, you know, subtracting uh, the model with no feature. You cannot build a model without any feature, right? So, you know, you will have two to the power n minus one model. So, in a, you know, if we have a total of four features, we'll have two to the power four, which is 16 minus one, 15 models, right? And for each subset model, we evaluate the average incremental R squared contribution of each feature. Now, R squared is something which comes from Ajahn and Budesco's theory, right? Um, and, and at this point of time, you see, we have implemented R squared uh, uh, implementation, uh, you know, uh, and the concept of dominance is based on R squared. And there are reasons behind it, which I will touch upon a bit in the next slide. Uh, you know, uh, you can also read more on that on our official documentation of the library. Right, but we are also expanding the scope to consider other accuracy metrics, right? Because R square, uh, you know, only works for uh, linear models, right? So, you know, other accuracy metrics like uh, uh, Gini coefficient, log loss, and others, right? So, we are we are expanding it, and we'll talk about it, you know, um, in a bit. Um, um, you know, um, now so let's look now look at a scenario where we have um, you know four features, right? So, you know, if you see this is a four feature world, and I said there will be fifteen models, right? So, four model with one. Uh, feature each, so 4C1, so four features, right? Uh, 4C2, so there's six features with two, uh, you know, six models, sorry, six models with two features each. And 4C3 will give you four, so there'll be four features with the four models, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, I'm using features and model interchangeably, sorry about it. So there'll be four models with three features each, right? And there'll be one complete model, right? Uh, which will have all the four features. So what we have done here, you know, if you see the maths here, right, we, you know, what has been computed, you know, as the overall average is the average incremental R squared contribution across all subset models, right? Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, as I said, the beauty of this maths is same as safely value. If you see the, you know, um, R squared of complete model that's coming out to be 0 0.584 and, you know, the um, average incremental R squared contribution of each of these features if you add them up, it will come out to be 0 0.584, right? So that's the beauty of maths right here. Uh, so what you, the, to find the percentage relative importance, you can divide the individual, you know, uh, average incremental R square by, you know, uh, uh, the overall R square, and you get the percentage relative importance, right? So uh, that's the way the maths of, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, dominance analysis works. Uh, you know, now, there will be a lot of questions, I know, right? There will be a lot of questions. Hey, you, you consider R square, uh, what will happen if the target is categorical, right? Uh, or what will happen if, if, I, if I'm building a classification model? Because most of the times I build classification models. Now, in case when the target is continuous, R square works well, right? But in case when the target is categorical, we need to compute R square equivalents, and they are known as pseudo R square. Um, there are four popular pseudo R square majors, right? They are uh, McFadden's pseudo R square, Nagar Kalke pseudo R square, Cox and Snell. I mean, there are multiple pseudo R square majors. A lot of research has gone into this area, but these four are the major ones, right? Estrella, Cox and Snell, Nagar Kalke, and McFadden, right? Uh, you can choose any of these four, uh, you know, uh, uh, majors as parameter in the library, right? So you can you have a choice of choosing any one of these. While we have certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, a preference for McFadden's uh, pseudo R square and there are reasons behind it. You can read um, on the documentation page, but you have the flexibility to choose any one of these, right? Um, now, there are a few criteria which define robust measure of choosing a metric for evaluating feature importance, right? 
Um, and the, here are these majors, right? Boundedness, linear invariance, monotonicity, intuitive interpretability. Now, boundedness means that the majors should vary between minimum of zero, indicating complete lack of fit, and a maximum of one, indicating perfect fit, right? So uh, any major that you choose, right? In, in our case, in this case, I'm giving an example uh, using R square, but any major that you choose, you know, uh, should vary between zero to one, right? Uh, uh, you know, it should have a linear invariance. And, and that means that, you know, the major should be invariant to non-singular linear transformation of the variables, right? Uh, and when I'm saying variables, I'm talking about the dependent as well as independent variables here, the x's as well as the y's, right? Um, um, you know, uh, monotonicity means, you know, the major should not decrease with addition of a predictor. So if you keep adding predictor, you know, uh, uh, to the model, if you keep adding features, it should not happen that the major, you know, uh, the accuracy major that you're taking or the major, you know, in this case R square should not decrease. So your major should be such that it does not decrease, you know, uh, um, while you keep adding, you know, your features, right? Now that's, that's, there's a trade off uh, around that and I will, I'll talk about it maybe, you know, when I get time. Uh, uh, you know, and also, you know, the major should be intuitively interpretable or intuitive, there should be intuitive interpretability around it. Right. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and in that, you know, it should agree with the scale of linear case for intermediate value. Now, you know, uh, a lot of questions can arise that, hey, you know what, uh, you know, I, I use XG boost or I use GAN, you know, for my uh, um, uh, you know, work. Um, you are suggesting me to find relative importance using a, a very uh, a traditional method. I mean, that's not true. So you can still build your you know, model uh, using any of the methods that you talk about. But for finding, you know, uh, this is model agnostic, right? So uh, uh, at this point of time, the implementation had been done for classification and, you know, uh, uh, regression, uh, popularly called. But you know, th this is uh, this is model agnostic. So any model that you build, you can still go ahead and use dominance analysis for your feature, you know, uh, uh, importance, and it will give you more intuitive and more accurate, uh, you know, feature importance as such, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. So it basically helps you, as I said earlier, developing uh, you know robust marginal resource allocation. There are few things which are you know very unique in terms of theory, also right, very unique to this library, right. So there is no theory on something called as you know a dom uh, majors, right. So do dominance majors. So dominance major is something which we have defined, right. So uh, when we talk about relative importance majors, right, a relative importance major should be able to describe a predictor's direct total and partial effect. And therefore we have defined do, you know, uh, uh, dominance majors, right? When we have come with four different types of dominance majors, right? Uh, 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 as I said earlier, these majors have been conceptualized, defined and formulated by us, right? And are unique to this library, right? And not only library, but in terms of theory also, this is a unique concept that we have developed. Now, you know, uh, when we talk about global, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 expandability, uh, when we talk about uh, feature importance, right, uh, uh, we only talk about plain feature importance, but in this case, we have defined something called an interactional dominance, which is the incremental, you know, contribution of the predictor to the complete model, right? Uh, so hence the interactional dominance of a particular predictor X, right? So if you take a predictor X, the interactional dominance of that particular predictor X with the difference between the R square of complete model. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm using R square again and again to make it intuitive for you guys, but between the metrics or accuracy metrics of the complete model and the R square of the models with all other predictor except that particular predictor X, right? Now the individual dominance of predictor is the R square of the model between the dependent variable and the predictor, right? So the bivariate model we're talking about. It's, you know, that's what, uh, you know, individual dominance is all about. Average partial dominance is average of, you know, uh, average incremental R square contribution of the predictor to all subset models. We saw that, you know, uh, a couple of slides back, right? So all subset model, except complete model, right? And the bivariate model. So you exclude the complete model, you exclude the bivariate model, and then you find the average incremental R square contribution of predictor across all subset models. And that will be your average partial dominance. The last measure of dominance, you know, which we are calling total dominance, summarizes the additional contribution of each predictor to all subset models by averaging all the conditional values, right? And total dominance is something which basically de defines, you know, um, uh, or basically gives you, uh, 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 you know, uh, the relative importance or derived importance of the predictors. Now, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, we also have, you know, uh, one additional feature uh, in the library is around dominance levels, right? 
So uh, dom there are three levels of dominance while comparing each pair of predictors, right? A predictor is said to completely dominate other predictor if its dominance holds across all possible subset models. So across all possible subset model, a particular predictor X1, you know, um, uh, you know, the contribution is coming more than X2, right? It means that, you know, X1 is completely dominating X2, right? Uh, conditional dominance, right? A predictor, uh, you know, is said to conditionally dominate other predictor. If across few of the you know subset models it, it dominates or it, it, it its contribution is higher, uh, but fewer you know uh, then it's called as conditionally dominating. Right? General dominance is about you know if uh, the overall average additional R square contribution or the relative importance of predictor is greater than the other, then the predictor is said to generally dominate the other. This is also very valuable in case of feature engineering, right? So. Uh, there are a lot of framework around feature engineering, auto feature engineering, right? We have built uh, a robust set of, um, um, you know, auto feature engineering framework for our augmented analytics platform. And what do you realize? While there are methods like MR, MR and others, you know, uh, dominance analysis, you know, with uh, dominance levels, you know, can give you a very good framework for feature, you know, auto feature engineering and auto feature selection. Now, you know, uh, uh, you know, as I said, dominance analysis library has some unique features which are not available uh, in, in, in other similar libraries, right? Uh, there are other uh, implementation of dominance analysis across R and Python or similar methods across R and Python. Uh, we all know about SHAP, that's very popular, um, you know, uh, and then, you know, there are other, other libraries as well, right? Uh, uh, you know, one of the good things about dominance analysis is that it works with covariance and correlation metrics. So you don't need to pass the data set. You just pass the covariance or correlation metrics and uh, it will compute uh, uh, the relative importance of predictors for you, right? Um, um, as I said, dominance uh, levels and dominance statistics are something which is um, um, only uh, there in dominance analysis library. Uh, there's an implementation, parallel implementation in R, which has kind of uh, done that. Um, uh, but uh, you know, uh, DOM stat is something which is very uh, um, you know um, um, limited. Or, you know, very very uh, it's a USP for this library alone, right? Uh, uh, we have done the implementation in Spark now, and we are also building it uh, um, in Julia. So uh, dominance analysis is you know computationally intensive process, but uh, with Spark and now in Julia, you know uh, we hope uh, you know uh, not hope, but we have tested it, right? It it, it works pretty fast, um, you know, and, and 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 you know the performance is much better. Now, of course, you know, uh, you know, there are future scope, right, um, uh, for this library, uh, and especially when you have such a good library like SHAP, right. While this library is more intuitive, if you go through um, a documentation, you realize that you know the uh, the explainability provided by dominance analysis is more intuitive, is more fit for uh, you know a wider uh, uh, consumption, right. There is something that we are doing on top of uh, uh, this library, right. So what we are doing is we are, uh, as I said earlier, we are using other metrics other than R squared for marginal contributions. Uh, some work has already been done. Um, you know, we are going to have that uh, in uh, on July 15th, the rollout, right? Uh, hopefully, right? Uh, when we'll have a lot of other uh, uh, metrics. Um, you know, um, we are working on the maths bit, right? Which, which uh, you know, which which you can use. Uh, we are also uh, uh, having some other approaches like Mahalanobis distance and the right. Um, uh, added to uh, the library, right? Uh, one of the things that we are doing, um, and you know, in another uh, two, three months, we are going Hishank, to- uh, just a gentle reminder, we only have five minutes and then we can do a small Q&A as well. Yeah, so I'll try and wrap it up fast, right? So uh, understand, you know, how the dependent variable, so Taguchi is two-way interaction, if you know about it, right? It's pretty powerful. There is no implementation on Python yet, uh, you know, and we are uh, basically on top of dominance analysis, we are, uh, you know, implementing Tau, which is two interaction to understand how the dependent variable in turn have an effect on independent variables, right? So um, uh, that's something that we're adding to it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, we are uh, going to implement dominance and also deep learning models, right? Uh, similar to SHAP library. Uh, there's some implementation work that we're doing in that area also. And one of the things that dominance analysis doesn't do, uh, 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 you know, now, and uh, we are hoping that, uh, you know, we will have that uh, uh, rollout, uh, you know, sooner. Uh, um, in the open source world is implement dominance analysis for, you know, uh, local expandability, right? So, um, you know, we are working in that area also. Now, while we are talking about, you know, uh, local expandability, uh, it's uh, important and you have already, you already know about SHAP, right? But I want to just compare these two methods, right? Uh, pretty fast, right? It's uh, important to basically uh, talk about uh, SHAP, right? Um, um, as I said, the maths 
behind both, both the methods um, uh, remain um, same, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, the math is pretty much same, right? And uh, uh, so when we talk about a good explanation model, there are three properties of good explanation model. And you might, you must be knowing this, right? So there is this local accuracy, right? Meaning the explanation model gives the same value uh, as the original model. Missingness, right? Uh, which means, you know, when a feature is missing, the importance of, of that feature should be zero, right? Uh, uh, you know, we have seen that, right? And consistency, right? Meaning if a particular feature has higher impact on model A than model B, then its importance in model A should always be greater than its importance in model B, right? So uh, these three are properties of good explanation model. Uh, these properties closely align with the axioms of safely value that I talked about earlier, right? And these properties hold true for dominance analysis as well, right? Uh, the only thing that's missing, as I said, is local explanatory at this point of time. Now, one great thing about SHAP is that it works irrespective of any model that you choose. And that makes it one of the most popular libraries among ML practitioners, right? Uh, uh, dominance analysis also does that. But as I said, you know, we need to uh, include a few uh, more metrics, uh, you know, um, also work on the local explainability bits. So that's what we are doing. Uh, the way SHAP works, we all know, you know, uh, uh, there is uh, this, you know, uh, explainability as well as interpret, so, you know, the, the prediction provided in parallel. So the data set is, uh, you know, passed through a black box model, you get the prediction, it's passed through SAP explainer, and you get the explanation, right? So the way it works is that irrespective of model that, will, that you will choose, it will provide the explanation both at global and local level. Now, you know, in the interest of time, I will not go into detail. I wanted to, I intend to discuss this and also show you on Jupyter Notebook, right? But in uh, interest of time, I'll quickly, you know, take an example, uh, you know, use case with both SHAP and Dominance Analysis Library and compare, right? So this is a publicly available uh, uh, data set, um, uh, the Boston host housing data set, right? Uh, basically, you know, you have set of uh, features, uh, features like per capita crime rate, right? Uh, features like, um, um, you know, uh, percentage of lower status of the population and others. And the target here is house price. So you're predicting house price based on these features, right? So what we did, we ran it uh, through SAP, we ran it through uh, dominance analysis. You know, if you compare dominance analysis and SAP for global explainability, you will get similar feature importance, both in terms of magnitude as well as direction. However, the metric, you know, selection is very important here, right? And this is because both methods follow the same underlying principle of, you know, uh, correlation game or cooperative game theory, right? So you will get, you will get similar results here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, one good thing about SHAP, uh, you know, which, which, which we really want to implement, you know, um, and, and, and see, these two libraries, are not, so you can, a lot of people can say that, hey, dominance is just copy of SHAP. It's not, it's entirely, you know, different, uh, uh, while, the, while the underlying concept is same, you know, if you see the implementation, it's entirely different, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, so SHAP provides you decision boundary, right? And explains how a single feature affects the output of the model by providing the directionality for each variable in the model, right? Um, uh, by considering all the data points. Now, if you see here, uh, in this particular case, I don't know whether it's clear, but if you see, you know, what it basically shows is a, you know, a surge in, you know, house price, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, with, with uh, you know, with the, you know, when, when percentage of lower status population is lower in the area, right? Uh, uh, you know, so, and, 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 you know, so if you see L stat, this is eight, I don't know whether it's visible, but, uh, you know, if L stat is greater than eight, it pushes house price downwards. And when L stat is less than eight, it makes house price go higher than average house price. It's very intuitive also, right? So that's what, you know, you'll expect to happen. Similarly, you can see a surge in house price or higher price for houses with large number of rooms. So if you, if you have big houses, you know, the price will be higher. Again, very intuitive. Now, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, this is something which is very, uh, uh, you know, decision boundary is something which only SAP does. Uh, but we have similar implementation. There's a kernel that we are developing. You can uh, check it. I will give you the link where we have uh, done similar exercise. Now, when it comes to local interpretability, right? Uh, SAP, uh, uh, you know- uh, Hi, Shashank, sorry to, sorry to interrupt you, but we only have five minutes. Uh, when yeah, the next this, is the last, this is the last slide, this is the last slide. Yeah, sure, please. So, uh, you know, SAP provides interpretability at, you know, each instance level to explain the process of uh, decision-making in a better way, right? So if you see in this particular case, right, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, in this particular plot, you can see that features like uh, uh, PT ratio, CRIM, and NOx are pushing the house prediction towards uh, higher value. And features like LSTAT, RM, and DIS, etc., you know, uh, you know, uh, yeah, DIS are pushing the house, uh, you know, price towards lower value, right? Uh, 
this also aligns with the last you know slide that I was talking about, where we saw that when LSTAT is greater than eight, you know, it pushes the house price lower. So SAP, you know, does uh, 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 you know uh, 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 the uh, local interpretability pretty well. Now, before I go into Q and A, it's important you know that I show you uh, the documentation, right? Uh, can you can you see my screen? Can you still see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So this is the official documentation of dominance analysis. You can go and read it. You can uh, provide us some feedback um, uh, through JIT, right? Uh, this is the uh, GitHub, uh, uh, you know, thing. As I said, there are public kernels on, um, uh, you know, on uh, on um, Kaggle, which you can refer, right? Uh, for both, uh, uh, you know, uh, when the target is continuous as well as when it is, uh, uh, you know, a categorical. Uh, uh, before I actually go into Q and A, uh, you know, it will be, it will be, you know, not good if I don't thank the fellow developers, right? My team members. So uh, Sajan Bhagat, you know, um, is uh, uh, one of the developer, uh, you know, and contributor to Dominance Science Library. We also have Punjita Patam Kumar who contributed, and we have Bala, you know, Kotesar uh, Kolori, uh, you know, who contributed to this library. So pretty much that. Uh, and thanks, thanks for your time. Thank you. Let's go to Q and A. So you have to end the uh, share and then you. Okay. All right. So yeah. So this is a very interesting question. So do you think interpretability in AI will get rid of data mining techniques like a priori, F, you know, grow it, etc. Right. So F, so you know, it's, it's not entirely true, right? Uh, uh, while you know, as I just said pre, you know, modeling or ad hoc, uh, you know, explainability and uh, uh, post hoc explainability, you know, are, uh, you know, so if you talk about, you know, ad hoc explainability, a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, techniques uh, do play a major role there. So it's not entirely true, but with great, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, research in case, you know, in, in, in AI explainability, uh, a few uh, traditional methods, you know, will not be used as frequent as they were being used, right? Um, no, so it does not have local explainability, as I said, right? So Pooja asks, you know, dominance analysis has both local and, uh, uh, you know, global explainability, and that's not uh, the case, right? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, dominance analysis tackles interaction between features, where SAP does not. How will D... Okay. So this is this is a very good question. I just said, you know, DA is computationally intensive. Uh, SAP does not cover... Thanks for pointing it out, right? SAP does not tackles interaction effect. Dominance analysis does it very effectively, but 1 million instance with 1K feature it will struggle, right? And therefore you see, you know, we are uh, doing it in Julia. Spark implementation does, you know, pretty well. We're also looking at some approximation method. We did not want to do that, but we'll have to do some approximation um, to for basically, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, increase the performance. Uh, good book on article to understand more about safely value. While if you want to uh, understand more uh, about safely value, there is there are a lot of articles on the web. Uh, but you can also go ahead and, you know, uh, look at our documentation. We have tried, uh, you know, uh, explaining it well there, right? Uh, would DA include indications on... So this is a good question, right? So if you see, you know, indication on heterostasis multicollinearity, no, because as I said, it provides a feature importance, but the underlying assumptions, you know, remain the same because these are, uh, you know, uh, underlying assumption of uh, 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 linear regression, right? So uh, heterostasis multicollinearity, et cetera. So uh, that remains the same, but it will not give you an indication as such. Does it support kernel strap? Uh, not yet. So this is something which is work in progress. You know, uh, we will we will implement this uh, pretty soon. Uh, all right. So sorry for uh, taking a little longer than expected, and maybe I would not have taken all the questions. Okay. But feel free uh, to write to me. Um, you know, um, and uh, as I said, through our JIT, feel free to commit. Uh, you know, feel free to send us any feedback or ask any question. We'll be very happy to. So uh, where can attendees uh, find you if they want to reach out to you? So they can reach out to me through, as I said, uh, my Git GitHub. So uh, uh, you can see my GitHub here, right? Uh, uh, you can search for Quint Shaker and you will get my GitHub. So that's the best way to contact me. Right? Great, great. Uh, thank you so much, Yashan. That was really insightful. And I'm sure that attendees will have uh, some really interesting takeaways. They would have learned a lot, I guess, uh, and that was really insightful. And, you know, again, thanks for coming here and sharing these. Hey, thanks, Vithal. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.